Your next homework assignment is due on Tuesday, along with the uh, submission for the water gems work that we did on Tuesday. Has anybody already started working on that one? Water gems? Okay. Um, it's a really powerful program, and you're probably the only fluid mechanics students in America that start using that program so early. Far more commonly, students wouldn't, if they learn at all, usually don't start on it until senior design or maybe like an advanced hydraulics class, but um, I think it's interesting to introduce the software as early as possible, so uh, hopefully that's a good exposure for you. And, um, the lab that we're doing next Tuesday is buoyancy, and we're going to switch the lab groups again. So group A will be at 2 o'clock and group B at 3. Is that switched, or is that what we did last time? I th just as I said that, I thought maybe I forgot to invert that. So it'll be B at 2 p.m. and A at 3 p.m. So correct that on the handout. So we're talking about forces on curved surfaces today, but before we get into that, I wanted to just give you a little bit of a leg up on this homework problem for 372. The key idea is here. Now we know that when it's a problem with a vertically oriented plate like this is, that delta H and Y bar are equal to each other. So delta H and Y bar are equal. So when you find the location of the centroid on a plate, that's also going to tell you the Y bar that you need to use for calculating YCP. And YCP is the location of the force. It's the depth from the water line down to where the force is located. And in this drawing, the force is going to be located below the pivot. They've put the pivot right into the centroid. And so you've got some equivalent hydrostatic force acting here, and then the force of the block on the gate is resisting that. Now they ask sort of the opposite way around. They say for, find the force of the gate on the block. So the magnitude of this will be the same, but the direction will be the opposite. So what you're essentially going to do in this problem is a moment analysis about this pivot where you have to find the quantity uh, YCP minus Y bar, because YCP minus Y bar will tell you how far apart it is from the centroid to where the force is located. That'll be your moment difference. And I've illustrated that before where you know, here's the formula for YCP and sometimes it's most useful to just find the difference between the two. So you'd move the Y bar from the right side of the equation over to the left side of the equation and then it's the gap distance between the two. So that'll be the moment distance. And then the other thing that you'll do is just resist that with an equivalent uh, moment couple, but it'll be the opposite direction. You'll need to calculate that, the magnitude of the force. So uh, in this instance, we're fortunate because the uh, pivot points right at the centroid. That makes things a little bit easier. But the process is the same as all the examples we worked in class last time. You need to find the depth to the centroid, the pressure at the centroid, That'll allow you to find the magnitude of the force. And then once you have the magnitude of the force, you move on to find the uh, location of the force, which is always going to be below the centroid by calculating YCP. Any questions about this one? All right. The concept of projections is really important when we're talking about curved surfaces because our problem solving process will be to uh, look at a curved surface and treat it as though it's flat because that's the tool that we have is finding the force on a flat surface and so we're going to have to uh, apply that to a curved surface by considering its projection. Now a projection can be thought of if you think about uh, shining light on your hands and the shadow that's made by whatever shape your hands are in. Uh, that shadow is the projection of a three-dimensional object. The shadow is just a surface, it's flat, but the object that it's representing has three dimensions. The same thing is true of, of any object, that it can be represented in two dimensions by taking a projection from some angle. 
And so the irregularly shaped piece that's shown here, if we shine a light on it, then the tracing of its shadow would have a certain shape. So this is the vertical projection. Vertical projection because the, uh, the light is shining horizontally and then the plane that the projection is traced onto is vertically oriented. So again and again, I'm going to refer to something's vertical projection and that's what I mean. I mean a vertical surface and you trace the shape that is made by the three-dimensional object onto a vertical plane. So I'll illustrate that with this curved gate, which is holding water back. And some important questions that we ask at the beginning of a problem like this, just to understand conceptually where the forces are and what direction they're acting in. First of all, you have to think about what's the shape of a curve. And in this case, it looks like it is a quarter circle but this goes into the page. This is a gate, a curved gate that if it was like a piece of paper, it's a curved gate like this, but it has a, a dimension into the page that we can't see based on the fact that it's just a line right now. But actually, it, it has some width. So it's a curved gate that's oriented like this. How deep is the curved surface? And so what we'll have to measure, the geometry that's relevant here, is identifying the depth of the water to the edge of where the curve begins. And that's one of the parameters that's dimensioned on the next drawing. Where does the curve intersect straight surfaces? And so it's partly about where it starts and where it ends. And this curve is going to be described with a radius where if we found a center of curvature, then this shape is, uh, it exists by drawing a, s a quarter circle about some focus point or the radius of curvature. And we'll need to know that radius in order to identify the height of its vertical projection. So just stepping through each one of these parameters individually, now we've got a dimension drawing. Just by looking at it, we can tell this is a quarter circle and um, the, uh, the depth to the beginning of the curve is 4 meters. So this dimension parameter here from the water line to the beginning of the curve is 4 meters. The curve radius is 2 meters and that uh, dimension up at the top, even though it's above the actual curvature, we can still tell that the length DE is the same as the length BC. And so it's two meters from here to here. That also means that it's two meters. AC is two meters because it curves around at the same distance. So AC also is two meters. So we've, uh, we've labeled all these relevant locations because it's going to help us to have the labels when we break this problem up into pieces. We're going to be calculating the weight of the water above the plate and then we're going to calculate the hydrostatic forces acting sideways on the vertical projection. So we'll find the horizontal component of the force according to the same procedure that we always have. And we'll find the vertical component of the force by just calculating the weight of the water above that surface AB. So this is showing those component forces. It's showing the vertical forces um, that arise out of element B, C, D, E. And if the surface goes one meter into the paper, then that means there's going to be some cube of water that's like this. So one meter, and it is two meters wide, and then it has a height of four meters. And so there's going to be a certain weight of this water, and that's the force Fv. And the location of that is also relevant. The centroid of this object, the center of area, is right in the middle. And so that's why they've located this Fv as halfway between B and C. So it's one meter from C to the force, 
and then it's another one meter from the force out to this edge B. W is the same kind of idea. With W, what that force is from is we've got this quarter circle, but then it's like a wedge. It goes this way, here. Now, let's see. I'm bad at drawing this sort of thing. So this is actually going to be you know, like this. So um, the weight of the water is going to be related to the volume of the liquid that's there multiplied by the unit weight. But now W isn't right underneath FV. Think about the location of where they've drawn W. Not necessarily up and down where they've put it, but side to side. Why do you think that it's located to the left of FV rather than right in the middle? What's that? Okay, so the center of area in this case isn't perfectly in the center. Why is it to the left of center instead of to the right? More of the area is on the left-hand side than on the right. If you look at it, if we draw a, uh, we draw our quarter circle inside of here, so it's like this. So this shaded area doesn't count in the calculation. When we're finding the center of area, it's going to be to the left of the middle. So that location of W is important. Okay, now F sub H, that quantity is calculated by finding the vertical projection of the curved surface. Now remember, this curved surface is <coughs> a plate. It was a flat plate, and then it got bent like this. And so it's flat in this dimension, and then it got bent. If we are shining light this direction, if we're shining light from the right towards the left, what shape is going to be made by that curved surface? It's going to be a square, right. Well, not, a, not necessarily a square. It's going to be a rectangle because it's going to have a width of one meter and it'll have a height of two meters. Okay? So it'll be two meters up and down and then one meter into the page means that it's going to be one meter across the bottom. So that is the uh, vertical projection of that shape. So here are the forces. As I mentioned, the vertical forces are equivalent to the weight of the water. And then the horizontal force, we go through and find the hydrostatic force on the projection, the vertical projection of that curved surface. And then this uh, ultimately F, the, the, re the resisting force that you have to add to keep the system in equilibrium, is the combined vertical and horizontal forces required to balance these out. And so it'll have a vertical component, which is equal to W plus FV. It'll have a horizontal component that's equal to F sub H. So we can go through and calculate these quantities. Is it better for me to dim the lights in here? Do we get drowsy? Well, I mean, it's balancing being able to see the screen versus getting drowsy because it's too dark. What do you think is the balance point? Is it fine like this? Is anybody going to nod off? Well, that would have stayed awake if it was a little bit lighter. I guess it's the opportunity cost that matters. If you find yourself drowsy, feel free to stand up. That's what I sometimes had to do in my most boring classes is I'd go to the back of the classroom and stand up just to keep from falling asleep. All right. First thing we're going to do is find the horizontal force. So find F sub H. And we're going to do that by calculating P bar times the area. And we know that's delta H times gamma times the area. Okay, so 
the depth to the centroid, if this object, the projection, is a one meter by two meter square that is under the water and has four meters from the water surface to its edge, here's the centroid, and I know that the delta H is going to be five meters. So it's five meters is the delta H. The unit weight of water is 9810 newtons per meter cubed. And then the area of that is two square meters. So it's 98.1 kilonewtons. That's the equivalent horizontal component of the hydrostatic force that's acting on that gate. Okay, so next, let's find the vertical force, F sub V. Okay, uh, F sub V that's drawn here is just the weight of the water in that uh, rectangular shape that's described by B, C, D, E. So it is the unit weight times the volume of object B, C, D, E. And so once again, our unit weight is 9810 newtons per meter cubed. And then the uh, volume is 2 meters by 4 meters by 1 meter. The 1 meter being the distance into the page. And so that is 78 0.48 kilonewtons. Uh, the weight of the water will be the next thing that we calculate, W, and that is the unit weight times the volume of uh, object A, B, C. And so the unit weight, 9810 newtons per meter cubed, and then the Volume is going to be a quarter circle times its distance. And so it'll be one-fourth of pi r squared, where two meters is the radius. We're squaring that. So one-quarter of pi r squared gives us the area of ABC. And then we multiply that by its one meter depth into the page to get overall the magnitude of the weight is 30.819 kilonewtons. Any questions so far? Uh-huh. The five meters is four meters from the water surface to the edge and then one additional meter to the centroid from the edge. Other questions? All right. So let's find uh, the horizontal component of F. So here in step four, the horizontal component of F f of x is going to be simply the 98.1 kilonewtons. That was the only force that we acted sideways. And so this force f is going to have a horizontal component and a vertical component. And the horizontal component just depends on the f sub h that we calculated. Okay, 5, we'll find the vertical component. of F. So F sub Y is going to be equal to FV plus W. It's going to be acting upward to resist their downward direction. 78.48 kilonewtons plus 30.819 kilonewtons gives us 109.299 kilonewtons. 
So the total magnitude of the force is going to be the combination of the two. F will be the square root of F sub X squared plus F sub Y squared. So it's the square root of 98.1 kilonewtons squared plus 109.299 kilonewtons squared and it is 146.87 kilonewtons. Now we could calculate that with knowing exactly the line of action for the horizontal force. We haven't yet calculated YCP, but we don't have to know YCP to know the magnitude of F because the magnitude of F just depends on the magnitude of the component forces that are acting on the gate, the vertical force and the horizontal force. Now, where F is located is a little bit more tricky and the angle that it acts at. But before we get into those complications, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with what's been going on till here. The uh, thing to keep in mind is that any time you have a curved surface, you need to find the weight of the water above it, and then you need to find the... Uh, the force that's acting on the vertical projection of it. So find out what shape is made by its projection and then calculate the force on that shape. So if you have a half of a sphere, for example, if we have a tank like this and then we put in a hemisphere so like, think about cutting, a, uh, cutting a, a softball or something. And we want to find the forces on that. Then it's going to be a circle. So you, you basically have a circle some distance under the water line. Here's the water line, the center of area. And you go down, you'd find the depth to the edge and then the additional distance. So there's the centroid. You need to think about what is the shape of the projection. And in the case of, you've got a homework problem where it's half of a sphere, that shape will be circular. And um, now the weight above a hemisphere, that's pretty tricky if you think about it. Like what is the shape of the water that's above that? So as it turns out, it's either the weight of the water above it or you can calculate the uh, the buoyant force. You can find out how much water is displaced by that. And the vertical force is also equal to the buoyant force. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But I, I wanted to emphasize in your mind that curved surfaces need to be broken down into their components, the vertical component and the horizontal component. So. Step seven here is to find the horizontal line of action. Uh, YCP, we know, is Y bar plus I divided by Y bar A. And it's a rectangle that we have with the area moment inertia is A, B cubed divided by 12. What if you don't have a figure in front of you that's showing which dimension is A and which dimension is B? Do you know on here, is this A or is this B and vice versa? Do you know which is which? It's the vertical parameter that needs to be cubed. Vertical is most important when you're finding the area moment of inertia about a horizontal axis. And so we cube B. So this is B and this is A. So in our rectangle, the projected shape, A is one meter and B is two meters. So the area moment of inertia for that is going to be one meter times 
two meters cubed divided by 12, um, that is 0 0.667 meters to the fourth. And we can go over to this, and the depth of the centroid, since it's a vertically oriented projection, delta H is equal to Y bar, so that means that Y bar is 5 meters plus 0 0.667 meters to the fourth divided by 5 meters times the area, which is 2 square meters. So YCP is equal to 5.0667 meters. That's the distance from the water line down to where the force is uh, acting. Everybody comfortable with the horizontal line of action? Okay, what about the vertical line of action? Well, we know that the, uh, let's take a look at this shape. F sub V is just at the halfway point. It's got one meter here, and it's one meter from that edge, because it's just in the middle. W is to the left of that. And there's actually a formula in the text in figure A1 that gives the uh, centroid for a quarter circle. It tells us that the centroid is 4R divided by 3 pi. So the distance is going to be 4 times 2 meters, since that's the radius, divided by 3 pi. That is 0.8488 meters. So that tells us that's the distance from the edge to W. So this distance right here is 0 0.8488 meters. Right. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense based on the logic. We knew that it was going to be to the left of FV. Fe was right in the middle because what it's, uh, what it, that force is, is a result of something that's symmetrical. But our quarter circle isn't symmetrical about a vertical line in the same way that that rectangular box was. So we know it, it's got to be less than 1, but how much less of 1? There we have it. 0.8488 gives us the distance from that left edge to where W is located. So what's the overall distance if we're averaging the two? Because we want to find out the combined vertical location of W and FV. It's the combined force of those two is going to be somewhere in the middle. So we need to do an average. But not just a simple average. We're not going to you know, add one meter and 0.8488 and divide by two. It's going to be an aerial average. It's going to be an average that's based on how big each one of them is, based on the force that corresponds to each. And so the uh, overall distance from the left edge the way to find that is we're going to do uh, FV times its distance of one meter plus uh, W times its distance of 0 0.8488 meters. And then we're going to divide by FV plus W. So the sum of those two forces is, this is a way of averaging the location where it's a weighted average and the uh, the importance of each position is relative to the magnitude of the force. Okay, so FV we already know uh, from before was 
kilonewtons. And W, we previously identified that is 30.819 kilonewtons. So the distance, we call this an XCP. The center of pressure in the horizontal distance is 0 0.957 meters. So that is the location from the edge, from the edge AC, how far out we have to go to the resulting force of W and FB. Any questions about that? I know this is out there. This is weird stuff. But if you give yourself a, a few minutes to think through it, I'm sure it'll make sense. Just have to reason through. So what we've got is a, uh, is a resulting force. And um, this figure shows that we had 109 kilonewtons was the sum of the vertical forces. And then 98.1 is the sum of the horizontal forces. And so the resultant is 146.9. And we'd already calculated that over here. But then this angle, the, the location of you know, like what angle that works through is related to the ratio of the vertical and the horizontal forces. And then you can see the XCP, as we called it, of 0.957 meters. And then how far below C it is to the horizontal force. All right. So I would like you to get a chance to try this example. And before I turn you loose on it, let's talk about the shape of that gate. Um, this gate, how is this gate different from this one? Uh, this one was con cave, and this gate is convex, meaning that it projects into the liquid instead of projecting uh, away from the liquid. And so you're going to have to follow the same approach of uh, thinking about what is the shape of the vertical projection of the curved surface. And you're also going to have to think about the weight of the water that's above it. So I'd like you to, uh, to take a crack at this. Go through those same steps that we did in the last example. Calculate the weight of the water above it <coughs> with breaking it up into components. And feel free to talk with the classmate as you try and break this up into pieces and find the magnitude of the forces. And then what you're going to do is find out where those forces are located because we have to do a moment analysis in order to find F. It's asking what force F is required to begin to open the gate. So it's not just finding the forces, but also finding where they're located so that you can do the moment analysis about the hinge. You've had a moment to think about this uh, example. Let me just pause for a minute and interrupt. Let me tell you how I broke the geometry down. So we've got water above the gate, and the shape of that component is 3 meters wide, 2 meters tall, and then it says in the problem statement that the gate itself is 4 meters long. So 4 meters into the page means that this cube is going to have uh, into the page dimension of 4 meters. And so there's A and then B. What I did is I said here is this rectangular shape, and we've got a quarter circle where there isn't water. And so if you want to find the volume of water above the gate, this element C as I'm calling it, well, you can find element B 
and subtract D, and then that gives you C. So you just subtract, and then you can find the weight of C. Now, there is a formula for the uh, XCP, the, the centroid for this kind of a shape. But the route that I took was I found the centroid of the rectangle and then subtracted the centroid of the quarter circle in order to find the centroid C. That's, that's how I'm going to show it on the board. But if you got onto your phone, you could probably find the formula for the centroid of this shape. Okay, so back to your own efforts here. I just wanted to interrupt to point out that there in the handout, I've got a little bit of information about the geometry um, as I broke it down for solving the solution. I'm going to start putting on the board here in a minute. All right, so as I mentioned, we have to break this up into components. And um, I've written the solution on the board there. It turns out that the force required to open this gate is 412 kilonewtons. And uh, that's being resisted, that force required to start opening the gate, which is directed upwards. The moment distance is three meters, because it's three meters away from the hinge, and it's acting upwards. And so whatever force it is, the moment distance is three meters. We have to consider the three different forces that are actually turning that gate counterclockwise. There's the weight of the water in the box above it, the weight in the water of this curved element acting down, and then the hydrostatic force coming in from the side. It's also causing that gate to rotate in a counterclockwise direction. So for it to be in equilibrium and us to start opening up the gate with force F, then we go through and uh, find the moment analysis according to what I've written on the board there. There's just one other thing I'd like to show you, and that is, what if you've got something and water isn't above it, but there are hydra, uh, hydrostatic forces acting from underneath? So if you wanted to find the equivalent force of the pressure that's acting on this irregularly shaped gate AB, what you do is you find the weight of the water that would be above it. You can see how they've traced out with the dashed line here. The, um, it's sort of the, the weight of the, the volume of water that would be above it up to the water line that's on the right side. The hydrostatic force pushing up is equal to the weight of the water displaced by that gate. And we'll get into more information about that, but I wanted to give you a preview of that concept because it's an important one, that it's not only the, uh, the weight of the water that's actually above the gate, but it's the weight of the water that could be above the gate if that gate or whatever the shape is is displacing something. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you in class on Tuesday.